Error. Welcome to Creation Station Monthly. I'm Bob from Creation Station. This is our monthly show where we talk to someone who's creative about some kind of topic, what drives them, what makes them interested in being creative, and how they express that creativity on their own in a particular topic. This month is dance. And I know you're like, Bob, how much can we really do about dance with the library? You just wait. We've got some ideas here for you. So our, we've got to guess we had a, a communication problem with um, one of our attendees today, but Sheila's here with us. Thank you so much, Ms. Sheila, for being here. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me, Bob. <laughs> so let's, I, I want to just jump right in on this and get us started on this because as we always talk about on these shows, on the monthly show, it's all about what drives someone, what makes them be creative and what, what gets you started. So about your idea of um, dancing, what brings you into that? What makes you want to do that? Um, you know, I think as a child, I was always somebody who was really active. Um, I remember being told this by my grandmother and by my mother that at a very young age, when they ask kids, what did they want to do when they grow up? I always responded, I wanted to be a dancing doctor. So, nice. <laughs> yeah. So I wanted to be a dancing doctor. That was my life goal. Um, so, and that was pretty consistent for a long time in my life. Um, my mom introduced me uh, to dance uh, around the age of six in New York. Uh, I remember taking dance classes from a former June Taylor dancer in her basement in New York. June, okay, okay, wait, wait, stop. For those of us who yes. don't remember, June Taylor dancers are? Uh, okay, so June Taylor dancers, they were a series of women, um, you know, uh, who primarily danced in jazz. They were similar to the Rockettes, but they were, you know, it was just a little different style. They would venture out a little more from that traditional line dancing. I also okay. wanted to kind of be a rocket, but I didn't grow tall enough. <laughs> I'm vertically challenged. So that was off the table. <laughs> so now what you said you wanted to do that, but now yeah. how did you actually get to do that? Is, uh, was okay. it a case of your parents really encouraged yeah. you or do you think that they just were like, okay, we're going to let you figure this out on your own? What well, as a, as a child, that's a great question. Um, as a child, like I found out my father um, was a ballroom dancer, like through high school and his college age. So dance was always kind of in the mix. Um, my mother was a pianist and a vocalist. And then my grandmother was also a pianist. So art. Was so you just always had music and 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 some yeah, creativity form of growing up. That's a good yeah. Thing. So I always had some form of art form, and I remember like my dad, you know, stepping on my dad's feet and him trying to teach me ballroom dancing, um, you know, at a young age. And they kind of, you know, if I wanted to dance, I could go and dance. If I wanted to try gymnastics, I could do that. I remember learning how to play the violin at one point, and then. Wow. Um, everything kind of like came to a head at one point. They, they were like, look, you're taking all these different classes. You need to pick one. <laughs> <laughs> and what age level is this at? What is, is this like passion? middle school, high school area? What, where is that? Um, I was, uh, at that stage, uh, I want to say it was the end of elementary school because okay. I was already performing, um, professionally at the age of eight. So I was part nice. of a local company um, called South of Broadway, and we would perform in Miami, Broward, and Palm Beach at local nursing homes and like festivals and That's fun. all these different things. And I just remember going to all these different outside events, being around creative people, doing my thing, right? And really just having a fun time. So... I chose that dance was going to be the way uh, for me. So I made that choice probably before I entered middle school. And is that when you gave up being a doctor? I, you know, um, I, I still love the sciences. <laughs> and I definitely at one point was, you know, tracking towards more sciences. But um, I went into education instead as my backup 
get um, because mm -hmm. for me, um, sciences were going to take too long and it was going to take me out of the dance studio more often where I was going to, if I went to college and I wanted to pursue something in my mind, I said, well, I can always get a teaching degree and teach dance in a school like where I went. I went to the magnet program mm -hmm. here in Broward County for middle school. And then I followed that suit for high school. And I was like, well, I could definitely do that if I don't make it somehow, some way. So yeah. I always kind of had that backup plan one way or the other. It's really interesting too. I've got a niece who was super, super into dance. She was very excited. I was going to be doing this show today <laughs> and she's actually um, up in New York. She's going for physical therapy. She's, nice. yeah. she's completing her degree in that very soon. And so, yeah, I, I, I kind of seeing now a, a trend here of, cause you're like the fourth person now that's mentioned that you know, they want to do some kind of medical slash, you know, yeah. so, something in the, the healing arts, at least nursing or whatever, and then dancing. Do you think that that's something that is a parallel between how you feel about dance, how dance makes you feel versus how you want to help other people feel? Uh, you know what? I, I do. And as being the artistic director of Body and Soul for 20 years, I've worked with many dancers and I definitely see that parallel over time. So we have probably had more dancers with doctorates in medical doctorates and nice. um, academic doctorates than any other company. Um, so we've worked um, one season alone. We had a psychologist. She was a professional psychologist with her doctorate. We had a doctor of Eastern medicine, you know, serving patients. I had a social worker who now is actually getting her degree in dance therapy. So I definitely see the crossover. Um, and for me, um, although I stuck to education, my avenue of education is more of a therapeutic because I work with students with emotionally handicapped okay. and I use movement and yoga in my class every single day to teach mindfulness, how to center ourselves, how to become one and, and feel secure in our own skin. So mm -hmm. I definitely think there is a parallel. And for me, I've always said, especially like going through all those teen changes where your body grows and your feet are big and your arms are long and things are awkward, you, you know, and mm -hmm. in high school dealing with things, I always felt that dance for me was my outlet as if it always made me feel better. No matter how, what happened, I could yeah. dance it out on the floor and leave the studio 10 times happier than when I walked in. And I probably have saved thousands of dollars in mental health. <laughs> <laughs> because no, definitely. I mean, I think the, the going that whole, um, you know, slow, uh, slow dance. I mean, yoga is a, effectively a slow dance right. when, when you start doing it. I always talk about that when we're doing our exercise things. I um, you know, it's, I'm doing the same exercises here in yoga or these things that I did in the Marine Corps. It's just, we're calling them a different, different name yeah. now. Yeah. And it's just that kind of thing. Um, but now what kind of help did you want to get that you didn't get? Cause you said your parents were kind of your mentors. I want to get back to that. Cause I know there's somebody else in your life that helped. Oh with yeah, that for sure. Um, but you know, where do you think that that, before we get to that, I want to figure out where, what kind of help do you think you wanted to get that you didn't get? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, okay. Well, I think there's certain things, um, especially in the art world where, um, artists, it's like a give and take. Um, so artists love to share their art form. They don't love to share the hows of they do their art form because they feel like okay. it's proprietary in a way. And sometimes it can be, but not all the time. So I think um, I kind of learned by trial by error, <laughs> you know, yeah. with certain things um, from so many different people. So uh, for instance, like Body and Soul Dance Theater was a company that was pre-established in 1982. 
I took over in, 90, in 90, 1999, 2000, we rebranded the company as a nonprofit because it was a for-profit. Okay. But at that time, the original owners, they kind of said, here's body and soul. Here's all the choreography. Here's all the music. Here's costumes. Good luck. <laughs> ah. Like there was no, how do I do this? Uh -huh. <laughs> like, so um, that was definitely a trial by, by error kind of thing. They were like, keep it alive. Keep keep it alive. Yeah, keep the dream alive for us. And right. uh, here, bye, see ya. Yeah. Yeah, huh. so okay, um, that was, I definitely learned um, by trial by fire, you know, um, how to run a company. And like, if I could go back and talk to myself you know, 20 years ago, this is my 20th season running Body and Soul. Congrats. So if I could go back to that 23 year old girl and say, okay, <laughs> don't lose your mind with this certain thing because it yeah. will work out or, you know, dial back the passion. There's other ways to go through things, you know, where you don't have to, you don't have to make it harder. You know, so mm -hmm. um, I kind of had to go through that path of trials and challenges and spending thousands of thousands of my own money yeah. before I realized, oh, wait, if I put this interesting thing I'm doing on paper. <laughs> well, and that's that's where I want to go. About something you yeah. casually mentioned earlier. And one of the things that you know, in a lot of our episodes for this show, we were all, we're talking about physical things that people are making or doing We had an engineering yeah. show, for example, choreography can be written. Choreography yeah. can be uh, copyrighted. Right. And so how does that work for you as a technology that how do you, or I guess my, my be, the better way of phrasing it is how does that work for you to try and explain that to someone that no there are there is a foundational thing here that i can reproduce and sell and make a living off of even if you're not the actual dancer themselves well and that's the thing so what we do is we go ahead and we file um like our whole show as one artistic body of work um okay. so what i do is i go ahead and i actually have made a like written form of dance because the dance moves 90 percent of the time <laughs> and i say 90 have a name of some sort right okay so i have transcriptions and when i can't verbalize that word i use my creative stick figure drawings nice <laughs> with arrows and you know mm -hmm. um, so there's a written record of all of the choreographies that I've done over the last 20 years, whether I've done um, something for somebody's wedding that they hired me for, or something for, I was privately contracted to choreograph for the Fort Lauderdale Gay Men's Chorus, or I went ahead and I did something. So I have those documents. Now, the thing with copyright is it's very, it's very interesting because um, copyright laws, a lot of people don't understand, like you said, it's hard to kind of copyright a dance set. What is copyrightable? What is original and what is just reorganizing a plethora of movements, just like yeah. reorganize language? But there's a, a, an interesting discussion is like for musicians who create a song words they didn't invent a word necessarily yeah. they're using the english language and they're reconfiguring it into a, a way to form a new song right right same thing for dance i'm taking choreographing movements that maybe a lot of people know and then i'm reconfiguring them mm -hmm. into a so new now, language so now how much of that is in a given production, I mean, because I understand you're going to write out whatever, how much of it is uh, orchestral, going with the music idea, um, or jazz, you know, where it's Ooh. like, here's where you have, I can see where ballet, for example, everybody right. better be on the same beat at the right. same time or Swan Lake falls apart. Right. But then where do you get, 
where in there, how do you fit that, create that loose creativity to let somebody just let loose and do whatever they want in, the in a jazz form? Okay, yeah. So, um, and that's really, that's where the creative piece comes in. So every choreographer- This is why we ask these questions. <laughs> yeah, every choreographer works a little differently. I'm very, uh, I'm very systematic in my choreography. Um, there are certain times I'll have a movement phrase, whatever. I don't know, for some reason, this image of movement comes in my head and I'll come up with a phrase of movement and not really have a song or a music to go with it, right? Okay. So I'll write down this phrase and I'm like, oh, maybe I'll use that in class or, or something, you know, and I kind of keep it because it's a good idea. I like it, but I haven't married it anywhere. And then there's other times where I'll hear a song and I'll meticulously dissect that song and I'll listen to it over and over and over again. And I, I use different hash marks. So like I'll do, uh, my methodology is every eight count, I do a straight line every, you know, every five eighths, I cross it. And then if there's a nuance in the music, I have different little uh, notations that I use. So let's okay. say there's timbers or there's a bell or, and sometimes when you look at that pattern after you've dissected somebody else's work, you say, ooh, well, the music is five minutes long and it should have an equal number of this and that, but then you're like, oh, but there's only, this only happens like three times and this only happens. And then you kind of build from there. Mm -hmm. And then where those nuances come in is you say, okay, I'm not quite sure. I want everyone to exert this emotion, right? And you practice certain things. So there's been times where, for instance, we did this piece and it was called um, uh, seven and 10, right? Okay. I didn't tell them what it was about. I said, okay, it's seven and 10. That's what the piece is called. Okay. And as we're building it, and they're like, are we a clock? Are we telling time? <laughs> <laughs> right? Because they could see, all of a sudden, they realized that they were the cogs of the clock uh -huh. moving. And everybody had their own synchronized series. When in isolation, they looked crazy. But when they did it together, all of a sudden, the clock came out. And you could see all the pieces of the clock moving. In nice. The you know? So now, here's a question for you on that. To, yeah. to break into that train of thought for a moment, because you just made me come up with this. I can see that really easily from up above right. or at a perspective angle. How do you do that one? Because 90% of the time, I'm just facing the stage How barely above maybe the stage looking down. Um. So that's where we, for me, I when I choreograph, I always choreograph from the bird's eye view. So I move the pieces in my brain, like little chess pieces, and I'm choreographing. So my notes always look from up down. First, one thing that I'm able to do is for whatever reason, the way my brain is hardwired, I see it this way, but when it transfers this way, you're getting an image, right? That mm -hmm. isn't necessarily the way I created it, but it works the same way because all the moving parts were doing what they needed to do. I see. That's what talent is. There you go. <laughs> that's what they and say. No, seriously. I mean, and that's what yeah. we talk about every month. And partially it's talent, yeah. partially it's training, partially it's, yeah. it's, it's experience. You know, you have that little bit of inspiration and you've got a good foundation and then you throw in a touch of talent and that's how it all works. Well, and the other thing is, is I think there's got to be a, a bit of ability to take risks. And, and be okay with trying something that you've never tried before and having a group of dancers who are willing to try that with you. So- um, That actually leads me to my next question for you too. You're perfect for a segue on this one, is what's, your, what's the biggest failure that you've had? How do you, do, one, how do you even define failure with dance? And what do you think is, is the, the one that you've had the, to experience and deal with? Okay, so I have had a couple of choreographies that uh, at the time I was like, this is brilliant. This is awesome. This is, this is great. 
it was a great choreography and it was the wrong set of dancers. Okay. <laughs> right? So what happened is, is that I took this great idea and that group was not ready for that challenge. So for me, if I didn't make them look good on stage, it didn't make me look good on stage. Therefore, it was just a failure. Yeah. Um, however, there are sometimes when I see those choreography blunders and I go, wait, you know what? It might not have worked there, but let me try it with this person. And all of a sudden, the stars align and it's serendipitous and it all works out exactly the way I wanted it to work out. And I think um, that's where I've made casting decision changes um, where I'm like, mm, I thought you were good for this part, but now let me introduce somebody else. Yeah. And, and how much of that happens is it for, especially with the choreography portion of it, how much of that happens per dancer versus the troupe overall? Um, I, you know what, for me, uh, I think when I was younger, it might've happened more often because I was less experienced. So like I would um, choose a dancer based on maybe aesthetics or what I thought envisioned what they could do and not necessarily considered what they were actually producing. And as I created more works, I could actually tailor things custom to that person and um, make them look leaps and bounds within their parameters, uh -huh. right? Like an efficient dancer. So one of the pieces I created um, for our show, Psychosis. That's it. Okay. I, I, yeah. You oh, just yeah, said sorry. efficient, and I want I want to. I want to pick your brain on that one. Okay. Efficient or evocative or emotional? What, which is the better way to think about? Emotive? See, for me, for me, it's always efficiency. Like, uh, for me, like, I'm very precise and efficient. However, there's this one dancer I can think of particularly. His background was musical theater. He's an amazing vocalist spectacular he's a good mover but he's not the best dancer he's a okay. good mover however i created a part for him in this show where he could emote all of his acting right he didn't have to say a word but he had all of that inner demons right and I told him, I said, this is, everybody is going to believe the entire show that you are the doctor. And in the last piece, we are going to reveal that really you are cuckoo crazy bananas like all the rest of us. And there's going to be little hints of this throughout. If they're paying attention, they'll notice that the true doctors are only in black and white and all the patients have color. And although you have the white lab coat and the black pants, you always have some sort of purple around you, you know? <laughs> you know, I, did you put that show on down here in Fort Lauderdale, didn't you? Yes. Yeah. I think I saw that show. <laughs> yeah. We had, moving, huh? we had moving walls and girls in glass boxes and, Electronic. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to go back and really think about that. Ask my wife. My wife took me to to the one. And I'm like, I'm, <laughs> yeah. now all of a sudden you're wait, doctors. Wait, I remember this thing with doctors and like, yeah, huh? That, and see that that's exactly why we do this kind of thing. Is dancing is definitely creative, but it can definitely also be, as you've been pointing out, you can make a business out of it. You can do. You can. It can be a good life for you. Yeah. Um. If you weren't going to be doing this as a career right. for all those people that are out there saying, okay, well, yeah, I, you know, I, I'd love to be the dancing doctor, but I got to pay the bills and the doctor is going to pay the bills, not the dancer. Right. What else do you think dancing is helping with in other things? You, you started to mention education and I cut you off earlier. So yeah. fill us in on those sorts of things. Um, for education, I think, um, you know, with a push for a lot of our our children are now very tech savvy and tied into technology and maybe a little too tied into technology, kind of like, you know, where you see the movie Wally and you got these people just tied into, you know, just 
everything's done for them and they're just kind of, you know, floating around in the universe. Um, dance gives them that outlet to be within their own body and be safe within their own skin. And I think uh, we've kind of lost that. However, during this last, I feel like 10 years of isolation, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, it allowed us to kind of say, all right, yes, you're stuck in your house or you're stuck here, but hey, my Wi-Fi connection, I can go outside in my backyard. Do you guys want to join me and do some outside yoga? Let's get out in the sun. We can do it together, but by ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and it kind of like really kept us together and gave us that mental health um, for education purposes. It, it um, stimulates your brain, gets you ready to move, gets you ready to think. Because even if you don't, if you're not conscious of it, when you are following yoga, you're using your right and your left side of your brain. Yeah. yeah. You, and you have to problem solve because they're like, okay, we're going to do this pose into this pose and this pose. It's memory. It's tapping into following directions, reversing things. You know, all of those things are key to learning. And the more you tap into it, the more I, I notice with my classroom of students, the happier they are. That's good. That's a very good thing. Yeah. I mean, and I do think I mean, when somebody proposed this topic to me, I was like, dance, really? I mean, that's what I do in the car sometimes. I, I'm not. I'm, <laughs> I do too. My, my standard joke is I dance at weddings and funerals. Um, <laughs> so, and that's about the only place I ever do. Um, but it is, like you said, it's something that definitely brings it out for everybody. Every, everybody can dance. Yeah. Whether you feel like you want to be up on a stage dancing is a different issue, but everybody can do that little thing in the car as they're singing along to yeah. the music or whatever that they're doing. Um, so that's where I want to, my next question really goes into, where do you think society thinks about that for people who do this professionally? I mean, do you uh, think, I mean, because yeah. whenever, when I first started coming up with the ideas for this show, it was like, oh, so who are you going to interview who does ballet? And I'm like, uh, there's a lot more stuff than just ballet out there, guys. Yeah, I think um, television shows has helped a little bit with opening up the genres, you know, like seeing um, competition shows like So You Think You Can Dance and like Dancing I, with the Stars or I don't know. I don't watch any of them necessarily no. um, because for me, it kind of, it's not that the choreographers aren't doing beautiful work and this and that. It's that it portrays a not real reality of what actually goes on um, in an awesome. audition process. Yeah, it, it's it's all for glitz and glam and that's not really what it is. The other thing is, is that um, it, for one of the things for Body and Soul is we really work on building each other up instead of tearing each other down. So, even in an audition process, if we didn't take you, we don't make you feel like you've really like lost out. We, you know, we guide you towards something else, you know, um, that might be more appropriate. So we don't necessarily belittle people and stuff like that because oh, yeah. creative expression is, is it's, you're taking an emotional risk and you're really, for me, when I dance, like my heart is on my sleeve. I got a thick skin. I don't care whether you liked it or not, but not everybody is like that. You know, and I've had students who've cut a rug and, and gotten so emotional. What they did was amazing, but their emotions, they couldn't control. It, it, mm -hmm. it brought so much to the surface for them that they were completely moved, you know, to tears, you That's know, good. and, and yeah. that happens, but, um, I think overall, like, it's helped us, but it's hurt us in a way, too, because, hey, why do I have to go to your paid event when I can log into YouTube and type in da-da-da-da-da mm -hmm. and see stuff for free? So it's yeah. kind of a double-edged sword. And now how does that – just to, to do a little bit of nuts and bolts with this. So you have a, a show that you want to put on, and you need 12 dancers. And mm -hmm. those dancers get paid per show or whatever it is like that. Right. Um, 
if I come in an audition and I'm number 13, number 14, can I still hang out? Can I still be there and do all the stuff and show up at auditions and do all those things and learn from everybody around me? Yeah, and that's the thing, that's the one thing where body and soul, you know, um, where we're different. We might have 12 paid slots. We know that we have enough money for 12 bodies, right? And that, we can't go over that, but we have dancer 13 or 14 and they're good. We just don't have enough money, right? To So we either have what we call a family meeting and we talk to our 12 paid dancers because a lot of the times the people who are with us, they stay with us. So when mm -hmm. we have an opening, it's few and far between. So if we're opening our doors, that means somebody is going out on maternity. <laughs> Or somebody's moving away because they got a job somewhere else. But yeah. otherwise, we have our very close family. And 90% of the time, if we all are invested in whoever dancer 13 or 14 is, our 12 dancers will take a pay cut so we can give them something. Or we can offer, or we offer them, hey, we can't pay you, but you can come and get the training. You don't have to pay for costumes or anything. You know, yeah. come, come along for the ride. And, and like the show that I was at, I, I seem to recall there was like several of the dancers or understudies were like working door and working other yeah. things like that. So, yeah, yeah. And that is, you know, and that was one of those years that we had other people who for this one show, we didn't have slots for them, but they were understudies. But the next show, which we did because psychosis, the next show we had was dance through the ages. So, yes. Okay. I definitely yeah. did see psychosis. I know I saw that one. That just <laughs> pinged it right in my head there. Yeah. Okay. No, yeah. I definitely saw that one. Yeah. And then we did dance through the ages the year after. So we went from like really kind of making that mark on mental health and talking about mental health because we, portrayed a few different uh a few different types of mental health issues yeah. in that show and then um we went totally the opposite and we did dance through the ages where we started from the birth of dance from king louis and a victorian ball all the way up to what i think dance would look like in the future you know what would dance in the future look like and i said well, we're going back to our roots and we're going back to fire, air, water, and earth, you know? Nice. And that's how we would go ahead because See, technology. I, you immediately sent me to like, okay, I want an anti-gravity, you know, waistband or whatever so that I can do true vertical, horizontal, diagonal, whatever, wherever, we however I want to move. We did lighting tricks to suspend people in the air, like for air, like mm -hmm. we did lighting tricks that were timed. So like the lights went off, the lights went on and somebody's flying in the air and it looked like they were in the air without nice. touching the ground. So, and it's so like the thought process that goes into that is. <laughs> oh yeah. So now that 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 takes us to our other question that that's an oddball one for dance, but I'm be betting you've got me an answer now. Um, what kind of equipment did you start with? And then what's your ideal? What's that one thing that would put you over the top that would just be so great? I mean, like for dancers, I mean, obviously I'm guessing some sort of performance area stage, something like that is your basic yeah. equipment. But I mean, is that where everybody starts is just on the floor and doing, I'm guessing. But Yeah, on the floor and doing it. I mean, and we've really gone through many, many different spaces um, over the years. So we had started tied to a local dance studio where we had been born. Right. And then after that, we wanted to kind of expand and do some other things. So then we partnered up with ArtServe and used their space for a few years. Um, ArtServe is a local arts organization down here in Broward for anybody who's not familiar with our local area here. And uh, they have a nice little dance studio. It's about 850 square feet. Um, and we've been displaced from that studio a couple of times because they had air conditioning issues and it damaged the floor. And then we were located in the annex in the back on carpet and cement so we've 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 done our trials and tribulations we've we have rehearsed everywhere you could possibly imagine whether it is a public park <laughs> grass somebody's backyard uh you know um so our number one i mean priority always is having that uh, space but not only having that space having that space 
that is truly designed for dancers. So it's not just having. So tell me about how that's food. different. Tell me how how is a, a stage for dancers different than a stage for acting or for performing on? So most stages are elevated. So they have the spring. When you walk on it, you can you hear the hollowness. That is a stage made for dance. If you're walking on a stage and you hear no sound, right? Or you hear like a thud and it's on concrete, that is not a stage for dance. That is a way to shatter people's um you know shin bones. You know, like, okay. because that's how you get all, all the dancers. Like I've been asked numerous times by, I have an orthopedist, a sports medicine. He's like, oh, how many times have you broken this foot? I'm like, I've never had a broken foot. And he's like, yes, you have, <laughs> you know, like, so what happens is, is from dancing on improper stages, we get little fractures okay. and sometimes dancers don't even realize it. So having a proper stage that's elevated and braced um, is one of the things um, that is the number one challenge, especially in Broward County. There's a lot of dance spaces, but there's not spaces that are properly elevated so that. So what would you do to, to create your own ultimate? What's your what's your dream space? So my dream space is this beautiful 20,000 square foot place right by us in Deerfield Beach. And I would love to open up a Deerfield Beach Performing Arts Center that's community mm -hmm. based. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do is have a performing arts center where dancers, actors, musicians could all commiserate together in yeah. a space that is properly operated and has what they need and working with like local artists say, Hey, this is what I need in a sound booth. And, Hey, this is what I need for my acting studio. And, Hey, this is what I need for my dance studio and actually listening to the artists instead of using a business model to just make the money. But if we look at the artists and give them what they need, the money will follow because yeah. the space is in that right frame of mind. So do you think it matters where the space is? Um, no, I mean, honestly, no, I, as long as there is that space, I don't think it really matters where, um, whether it's Broward, Palm Beach, Dade, you know, um, or whether it's in a rural city or in a suburban, I don't think that really matters. I think the artists, if the space is worthwhile, the artists will come. Okay. You know, um, I think a lot of times they put artists in, um, more of the urban areas and that's fine and dandy, but most artists in the artist area, you're, you, you're safe, but what you want to be safe also going to your car, <laughs> yeah. you know? So that's also, that's also an issue. Um, I do know, like being a resident of North Broward County, there's really nothing up our way for arts. We either need to go to Palm Beach County, um, and not something relatively close. So Deerfield Beach would be an ideal spot. I know they did open the Performing Arts Center in Pompano. Mm -hmm. However, I live, I work in Pompano. I live in Deerfield, and I never see any advertising for anything going on there. Well, I can tell you, we're doing a thing there for Artlet in uh, January. Well, First Saturday of January, we always do something there at the Cultural Center there. So yeah. come see us. I'm doing a virtual reality this year. Definitely. But you left me right there. You led me right into that of helping the artists out so tell me who were your mentors remember that that comment yes. way back earlier yes. so tell me okay. your mentors and how how did that help you build okay. on this career so let's see i think um i think in the public school system like i went to performing arts and i had uh two dance teachers there um I can't remember Miss Press's first name at this moment, but Miss Press and Miss Dawn Pruce. And they always encouraged me to kind of be my own creative self because they themselves were creative in non-traditional ways, I guess, if you were thinking about it, you know? 
Um, and I don't really know. I use that term really loosely because I, I think there really shouldn't be a limit on creativity. So there no. is no wrong answer. When no, you're no, that, that's what we're all about here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There is no wrong answer. So, but I think um, in the late eighties, they were testing boundaries that nobody had really tested. So therefore it was odd and strange where I was like, this is cool. <laughs> so that always kind of encouraged me. And then, um, Outside of that, I definitely was encouraged by Barbara Sloan, who was the director of Body and Soul. Okay. You know, that um, I always really gravitated to, towards her work and um, the messages that maybe at 14, 15, I didn't really understand. I just thought it was something really cool. I could relate to it in a certain way, but it wasn't necessarily the message she had posed until later when I looked at these choreographies and I was like, <laughs> you know, and I could understand kind of what was going on. And I also understand now why at 1415, I gravitated towards those messages, but I didn't understand the full message, mm -hmm. you know, so oh. I definitely had some local, but as a kid, I'm going to say, um, I wanted to be like Gene Kelly and Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire. So they were definitely like what I uh, thought dance mm -hmm. was. Um, so, and then watching the Thanksgiving parade of the Rockettes yeah. every year. Able to I dance backwards to dress and up like a candy yeah. cane. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So let's, let's see. One other question that we always sure. ask people is, what do you think is your biggest achievement? What are you most proud of that you've created? Something that makes you feel like, yeah, this I can pin my pin my hat on it. This was a good thing that I did. Whether that's a physical or whether that's a thing or whatever, or helping it's someone. The, it's the family community. I mean, like the body and soul dancers, like forget about all my works and stuff. I always say like my Sistine Chapel was probably psychosis. Although it was dark and and it was so, there were so many intricate moving parts that people didn't necessarily know that was going on. A lot of research that was behind that and a lot of risks that were taken. Um, and I would finish rehearsal going, hey, well, nobody died today, so it was great. <laughs> you know? Um, so um, I always say that was definitely like my, probably one of my favorite works um, that I was very proud of. But I think one of the things that like warms my heart, no matter what, is that the family community that we have built as dancers and that I, I gave dancers an outlet where they didn't just come to dance, but if they had that inkling to try and do their own choreography, I could help them. Mm -hmm. And I saw some fabulous dancers become excellent choreographers. And I don't think that they would have ever had that outlet if I didn't open that up to them. That's so really good. For I me, like that, that yeah. would be my legacy. Yeah. Now, you kind of lead me into another question on that. How does a dance studio actually work that way with um, putting on a production, is it possible at the local community level to do two or three productions at once if under like the umbrella of body and soul, and then there's three or four production teams? Definitely. Or... If there could be three or four production teams. Yeah. I think, um, more than one production would be our goal. I know, uh, for body and soul, we were doing at least. Um, two productions a year and what we would typically do is like the 1st. Our like winter production would be like fan favorites and maybe 1 or 2 new works of the new body, but it wouldn't be the full show. So we would name it something, you know, ambiguous, you know, or something that would lead up to, you know, whatever the final show was. Um, and then, um, but under the umbrella of a, another organ, like a, a body and soul. So if body and soul had its own space and we had theater and musicians and 
we could have the men power to do more. So when you're talking about grown adults who are doctors and, and, you know, uh, yeah, accountants and teachers and mental health professionals, and we're meeting three times a week. So we don't kill people, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, yep. doing our own thing and focusing on our own health. It's hard for us to produce a show more often than maybe once or twice a year, because we're only meeting a couple of times a week and doing yeah. training on top of that. But if we had more than one sect of people, we could definitely have shows more often. Okay. And creative teams. That's the goal. That's my And wish. now, do you think overall in dance as, as a industry, I mm -hmm. suppose, because is kind of what it is nowadays, um, what do you think that is community theater as we're uh, community dance groups as you are um, compared to something like Broward Center, which is really more just, they're just a host and various people come in to use their space. How does that whole ecosystem work for someone who really wants to get into dance? <clears throat> they're already in high school. They're already dancing. They're doing whatever. How does that work for them? Well, and I think uh, for them, like, the main thing would be is, is do they want, are they happy with the training that they're getting? You know, is it, is it that, Hey, I just want to continue and I just want to perform because that's where body and soul mommy, daddy company, you know, like that's mm -hmm. the, that would be their outlet. Hey, I'm really happy with my dance classes that I'm taking, but I want a performing outlet. Well, then body and soul would be your, your place. But if you're looking for training and the potential for many other things, then that's where the community theater thing kind of works for you because you come, you get training, then you get put into this kind of audition training and maybe, hey, we're doing a uh, variety show, you know, instead of just dance or just so then we're we're making money for the the organization and we're you know we can kick back to other people as well that's cool that so, sounds really nice now question for you as we want to wrap up we got sure. we're already an hour in is, is see, this <laughs> this is what we do we just we just keep on going and having these conversations <laughs> we can keep on going but i really do need to wrap up here in a minute no. but i first i want to ask because i've I noticed in my last question, I said it again, teenagers and kids. Yeah. It doesn't mean you have to be a kid to get started in this. No. Who's, who, what kind of people, I mean, there's stuff for everybody at all ages, obviously, if you've done it in the past, but for someone who's never done dance before or has no idea if they ever want to do dance or they're like me, yeah, I'll, I'll dance at the wedding with you, dear, but you know, that's, that's about it. How do they get involved in something like this? Or how do they figure out how to test themselves? Well, and the thing is, is that like, that's one thing that our local community centers kind of offer, you know, they offer these, you know, ballroom dance classes or these public kind of classes where it's not, oh, advanced jazz one, you know, like, or the moon, you know, and you're not in this or you're taking Chiquetti Ballet and you've never walked into a Chiquetti Ballet class and they're using all these terms that you have no idea and that offsets people. So one of the things that we, uh, that I've always wanted to do is like movement for actors or movement for, you know, just peace of mind. So I'm in talks right now with, um, Aki Mantra, it is a local nonprofit organization. They're Eastern doc doctors of Eastern medicine. One happens to be a former body and soul dancer. And oh, so cool. she's uh, doing community events. And she said, how can we use the mindfulness that you do in your classroom for a public event? So we're working on bringing what I do to the public so that people who don't dance have an outlet and it's not really for dancers it's really just for anybody so that sounds really fun that <laughs> sounds like it's, it's it does it's not, it's i mean that's the kind of community thing i mean i've we've talked about the poor a community of writers that just gets together to help each other out and work it sounds like it's that kind of thing um last question uh okay. that we've been doing everybody this year is how's it surviving through the pandemic with you 
Yeah, I, mean, I know. I dance, is, dance is one of those. We, we had somebody on who does improv, and they had a hard time, you know, struggling to, to, to migrate over to the online thing from theaters. I'm guessing dance is even worse. Uh, dance was definitely, uh, like our dancers who were dedicated in rehearsal, definitely, you know, there was technology challenges, internet, Wi-Fi speed challenges. Um, you know, if my, uh, partner here didn't hook me up to the TV, I would like, I wouldn't have been able to see them, you know, cause the computer is yeah. too small. A tiny me. little screen. Yeah. Tiny little screen far away. Um, it was definitely a challenge, uh, doing the online thing. Cause everybody was online. We, uh, opted as an organization to offer it for free to people. So going from that free model to a paid model has been difficult. Um, it is, uh, it is challenging. However, because I was online, there were some benefits. So, because I was online and I was offering things for free, um, my partner, Roger, he was like, hey, my friend Osni does sign language translation in Brazil for a nonprofit organization, and they're looking for something for dance. Osni logged in and took my dance class from Brazil and said, oh my God, you're fantastic. Can you come teach class in Brazil? Nice. <laughs> so, um, so like there were other benefits, like we got worldwide yeah. you know, coverage, which we wouldn't have gotten before just being in the local theater. So like when we did our presentation in June, I was actually presenting it from Brazil, but it was online and we had attendees. We had about 77 people log in, but we had 77 people from 12 different countries. That is awesome. So that's awesome. So for me, yeah, our attendance went down, but we went worldwide. Yeah. And as I'm throwing up the, the Facebook page for everybody, so you can go follow Sheila there. You yes. can go out there, Body and Soul Dance Theater. They're here in South Florida. But as she said, you can contact them now on Facebook and do this worldwide from anyone, anywhere. Yeah. And uh, get some hints and tips and tricks. Yeah. And, uh, and you would be surprised. Like I taught in Brazil and my Portuguese is not good. <laughs> uh, my Spanish is good, but my Portuguese is not good. And See, that's, that's you're a, a much braver person than I. Yeah, no, yeah, I would was, not be able to. It was 17 dancers in there eager to learn. And I was like, watch me. I do. You do. <laughs> you know, and nice. it worked. And honestly, I, I was, I was slotted to teach, like, I think an hour and a half class. And I taught, I think for two hours. And if I had stand, stood there and taught for two more hours, they would have stayed. Yeah. Now, it's they just something, it can be infectious. Yeah. When you get a, when you get that creativity thing and you just start flowing, it's just like, yeah, okay, wait, wait, no, no, next. Okay, wait. Oh, wait, if we did this, oh, wait, if I do that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Right. No, all the different fields it's, it's there and it fits. It's just yeah. amazing. And it was great. And it was wonderful. It kind of rejuvenated me, but. The pandemic has definitely been rough. What we're kind of thinking now is our next presentation is we're going to talk. Um, we're kicking around some names about indoor, um, I think is what we're going to kind of, I think that's what we were settling on. And we're going to kind of go through because we've been dialoguing this whole time. How has it affected us? So we're going to come up with different pieces to show what we were going through. And um, I keep thinking of like, you know, like a wolf pack, a wolf pack survives, right? Because the leader goes to the back of the pack, right? The strongest is behind where your weakest is in the front, yeah. you know, but you stick together as a pack, you know, and that's kind of what kept us together is that we had the pack, you know, and we stayed together as a pack and we just, you know, we were checking on each other and what you're not coming to class. Come on. Okay. We're not teaching class today. We're just going to talk today. You know, like, so we kind of just that did awesome. what we needed to survive. That is a great, great thing. Thank you so much. This is just an hour. It's just flown on by me. Sheila. This is just amazing. Uh, let me throw up our ending slide here for everybody. Again, thank you all for tuning in this month. Uh, Creation station at Broward.org. If you have any questions for our guests, I'll forward them on along for you. You know how to find her on the web. And tune in next month. We'll see you then, everybody. Stay safe.
<laughs> All right.